Welcome to Keep the Game Beautiful podcast. Each week, I highlight incredible people who are doing amazing things in soccer, the beautiful game. I'm Anna Turi, your host. Thank you for listening. Today, I talked to Tracy Noonan. So, Tracy played at UNC for her college career, and then she went to play for the U.S. Women's National Team and the 99ers team, which is pretty cool. Two U.S. Women's National Team players right in a row. So she now works with Dynasty Goalkeeping. She's actually the founder. And what they, they do goalkeeper trainings and a goalkeeper camp that's a small four-on-one setting. The, all of the keepers are female, and they have sp- a lot of support beyond the camp. They work on the whole person, nutrition, mental, and just support in general. At the convention, it was really inspiring to see former students of hers at convention, and they'd all walk by, and some of them have developed into coaches today. So enjoy today's episode. Today I'm talking with Tracy Noonan. Tracy's the founder of Dynasty Goalkeeping. Before founding her program for female goalkeepers, she played at a competitive level. She was a member of the UNC team and the U.S. Women's National Team. Tracy, would you take a second and fill in some of the gaps that I missed in my introduction? All right, I don't even know where to start there, Anna. Um, first of all, it's my pleasure to be here, so thank you so much for having me as a guest. Um, fill in the gaps from UNC to finding Dynasty Goalkeeping? Sure, we can go there. Okay, from there. All right, so... After I finished um, at UNC, I was fortunate enough to get called in with the U.S. Women's National Team. Um, So this would have been 96 through 99. Um, Tremendous time to be involved with the Women's National Team. Um, It was a reserve on the Olympic team in 96. And then obviously I was um, a member of the 99 Women's World Cup team. So that experience, um, unbelievable experience, hard to put into words. Uh, My transition after that was... um, into playing with the, uh, the first women's professional league in the WSA with the Boston Breakers from 2001 um, all the way through 2003. Um, when the league folded, uh, really wasn't too many other options for me to continue to play. Um, and then, you know, some unfortunate, you know, injuries to my knees made it kind of the correct timing anyways for me to retire from playing. And so at that point is when I transitioned into coaching. And then my coaching career started as a, a head coach at Greensboro College. And it's actually at that point that I started taking some of my... Um, coaching courses ironically so uh, the NSCAA you know what the US United Soccer Coaches is formerly known as is uh, where I started my coaching courses so I started with my my national diploma my advanced national and then I did my on the US soccer side I went through my B license and my A license so I went through all of those courses and then went back to uh, the NSCAA and did my premier badge so I've gone through kind of all of the um, coaching licenses and credentials here in the United States and that really helped me as a as a young coach to get my methodology and so kind of knocked those out within the first I would say probably the first two maybe three years as I got into my coaching Um, and then um, I was only at Greensboro College for two years and then I decided um, based on my experiences there that what I really was passionate about was not only the goalkeeping but really about establishing relationships with my players that's what I found most fulfilling so that's kind of what led me to forming Dynasty Goalkeeping um, because I felt like I could have a, a greater impact as a coach in that kind of more intimate setting and it, like I said it was definitely more fulfilling to me and that's where my passion was so I founded Dynasty Goalkeeping in 2006 and um, that's where I continue so I'm entering into my I think 15th year uh, running Dynasty Goalkeeping Yep. What are actions or things you do to keep the game beautiful? Um for me, it is, it's about creating experiences for my players that are fun, enjoyable, where they can engage with each other and develop that rapport. Um, I understand I'm just dealing with goalkeepers in my environment, but it is about creating a supportive, positive environment for my goalkeepers to encourage each other, um, a bit of a family atmosphere, because then they're going to enjoy the game more, they're going to want to be more invested in the game, they're going to want to stay in the game and then eventually hopefully give back to the game you know it's kind of that full loop that full circle how do you encourage others to keep the game beautiful one would be by showing a good positive example and hopefully through 
what they see in me and the passion that I bring to the game that inspires them. So that would be kind of the first one. Um, two would be kind of empowering them, like the coaches that are in my environment, is empowering them to become better coaches and giving them a little bit more um, environments to grow as a coach. And then also just a ton of encouragement and positive feedback to my students and coaches so that they enjoy the game. So in Dynasty Goalkeeping, you coach small groups of female keepers. Can you tell me a little bit more about the program? So that's probably one of the biggest premises. What you've just kind of identified is that we are really small and intimate. Um, and that definitely sets us apart from all the other camps that are out there. Uh, it's a different business model. It's about quality, not quantity. And within that environment, we are able to, because we are small and we have four staff coaches for 12 students, so our ratio is you know, second to none at one to three, we are able to give a lot more feedback to our students. Um, it's a lot more specific because of that and a lot more reps. And in addition, we're a lot more adaptable in terms of we're able to go to the weight room. We're able to do nutrition. We're going to go to Whole Foods. We're going to go on field trips. We're going to do individual meetings, video analysis. Um, in our lectures, they're interactive because they are small groups. <laughs> So those are some of the things that I would say are different um, on the front end because of our size. But in addition, we are, um, it's, it's a more holistic approach. It's not just about developing, you know, the next national team goalkeeper, the next pro goalkeeper, the next collegiate goalkeeper, the best, you know, goalkeeper. It's about developing the whole person. Um, so this is why the nutrition piece is important to me. Um, and it's about training them to be fit for a lifetime, not just, you know, throughout their playing career. And that's you know, the mental aspects, the, the nutrition aspects, you know, the fitness aspects. Um, it's, it's, it's that whole piece and developing their character, um, the whole piece of, of the athlete. And when you do that, I think what you do is you get a player that enjoys the game more and also typically reaches their potential better. So you talked about taking field trips. What might you do when you're at Whole Foods or other places? Uh, so we'll go over to Whole Foods. It, it comes right after our nutrition lecture, so we go through our nutrition lecture, and we might be talking about every year I have kind of a different focus. So, you know, one year the focus might be, I know in the past we've had a focus on added sugars and avoiding added sugars and why you might, would want to avoid the added sugars and sodas, juices, Gatorade, the sports drinks that were, you know, highly pushed to us as athletes and why they would not be beneficial to us as athletes. Um, so if that's our focus, then when we head over to Whole Foods after that lecture, then we're going to explore what are our other options and alternatives that we could be buying besides water um, that would be offered to us in Whole Foods. Um, in addition, sometimes I'll, I'll give them um, a bit of a, a team fun challenge, so we'll divide into like three groups to make it a little bit more fun, a bit of a educational scavenger hunt where I'll give them questions. So they'll go in as a team and they might have to look up certain things like a question might be, you know, which fish is highest in omega-3s? So they've got to figure it out by walking around the store, but they can't ask anybody in the store for help. So they have to read things, they have to look at labels. Um, it might be um, what food is highest, you know, what vegetable can you get that is a good source of iron. So there may be things in there that they might know, or they might have to investigate throughout the store and go look at some stuff. So it gets them kind of familiar with the store, thinking about, you know, better options, healthier options that they can find, you know, within the store. Do you add a little bit of competitiveness into a lot you do? Oh, everything. <laughs> For sure, everything. That's why we, when even when we go to, you know, Whole Foods, we're making it into a competition and there's a prize on the line. Just fun little stuff, you know, nothing major. Um, and certainly every, throughout the whole week, we divide our group into two teams. Every week of camp, we divide into two teams. And within those two teams, we assign team names, which already is like, a ton of fun just getting through the team names and then every competition for every day goes on a scoreboard in the dorm and from then on out for the rest of the week they're competing so yeah we are super competitive and have a lot of fun with it do you find that with the competitions they compete a little harder it definitely draws out I think that competitive fire when there's a little bit more on the line um, and it definitely allows them you know to have a little bit more fun throughout the week because they bond with their team um, there's a little bit more on the line and, um, yeah, it makes the challenges ratchet up a little bit more each night. So you said a little bit about interactive lectures. What might you do during these lectures? So because we're small at 12, 
first of all, it's an intimate setting because they're really close to me. Unlike, you know, a major lecture hall where you might have 50 to 100 students and you're presenting to them and it's you to them. For me, I'm sitting in the circle with them, in the, in the chairs, down at their level. We're all kind of at the same level. And um, if we're doing like a match analysis, I'm asking questions. So we might be watching a video on the screen. Usually my first lecture of the week is actually some homework that is assigned to them prior to even arriving at camp, they're getting homework. Some of it is some stuff that they can be doing physically to prepare for the week to be more successful while they're there. But some of it is also um, video analysis so that they're starting to tactically develop a bit more of a, a tactical IQ. So our very first lecture, we are reviewing their homework. So we're watching a video on TV that they should have watched with questions that they should have answered. And now I'm, you know, I'm engaging them and I'm asking them for their answers. So it's, it's interactive in that way. Um, it's same with the nutrition, the mentality. I've always got questions that we're, we're asking and we're having a really nice open dialogue so that we're learning from each other's answers. At the beginning, do you have trouble having people answer questions or are they always pretty open? It's about 50-50. You know, I can definitely tell, especially the first day, those that are kind of like hiding, like, please don't call on me, please don't call on me. Um, and certainly that's probably the kid that I'm going to seek out. <laughs> um, and then there's certainly others that are like always the first, like that they've got the answer. So it's probably very similar to what you're getting when you're in school. There's some kids that are very eager, you know, and have the answers um, and are ready to participate. And then there are others that really, you know, are not as confident sticking their necks out there and putting their voice out but um, that's also part of the process for, the, for those students is to start to get a little bit more comfortable being uncomfortable and, and that helps them to kind of come out during the week and understand that they are valued and that their opinion is valued and it's okay to make a mistake and that's how we're going to learn. Why is it important to be uncomfortable? That's the area where we're actually going to when we're getting uncomfortable is when we're stretched and it's also where we're going to make mistakes. And if we are not making mistakes, there's not nearly as many opportunities to learn and grow. So it is in that range where we're making mistakes that we now go, ah, I can get better here. But if I'm constantly staying in the areas that oh, my right foot is really good, I'm, I'm really good at hitting you know, right-footed goal kicks, and if that's all I ever train, well, then my left foot's not going to magically get better on its own. That's not how it works. So I have to get comfortable being uncomfortable which means I need to start training my left foot even though it might look ugly and it might go five yards and I might not be able to get it up in the air um, it's got to start somewhere so those are the areas I need to start to work on and not think about it as you know I'm not good at this skill or I'm bad at this it's I need more work on this I'm getting better right I'm getting better at this so it's a it's a switch in their heads about how they view it is that I'm not bad at it I'm getting better at it and I need to invest the time in it and I want to invest the time in it and that's embracing the uncomfort, the discomfort. So how did you and your coaching staff get together? Uh, my coaching staff is kind of um, always kind of growing and expanding. Mainly it grows and expands, you know, as oftentimes as my students age out. Um, as they get into college, I start to get them, the ones that are interested in coaching. Um, I'll invite those in um, to become staff coaches for my younger camps. Um, and then, you know, if they age out and continue to, after college, stay involved in the game, whether it's at the club level, collegiate level, whatever level that they're in, or if they're playing professionally, um, I try and get them involved with coaching at our, you know, our older age groups. Um, because, one, I love that they know our program and they know our philosophy, so they're, you know, great to have involved with that. Um, two, they are also typically females so I love to have more you know obviously are females because they're coming through my camp so I love to have as much as possible female coaches but that doesn't mean that I exclude male coaches I definitely always have um, male coaches involved in in my program um, last year for sure I had a few few male coaches so I, I'm definitely not excluding males from from our mix I think they're a valuable asset as well if you're a good coach you're a good coach male or female um, in addition, you know, I'm always bringing in new coaches even from outside of Dynasty because they're going to introduce not only to me but to our students different concepts and different philosophies, different methodologies, which I think are important for our students to hear. Okay, so that it's not just all Dynasty, Dynasty, Dynasty. Um, so if I hear of other good coaches that want to get involved, you know, I'll do an interview process and, and look to invite them in if I think that their philosophies are going to um, contribute and be in alignment with what we're trying to do and produce a dynasty and that they have the right experience. 
So I know one of the things you teased me about was nutrition this week. <laughs> so how important is nutrition for goalkeepers? Nutrition is important for all of us. That's how I'd face it. It's not any different for goalkeepers. Nutrition is super important for all of us as human beings. Um, I think we focus on it as, you know, it's important for athletes, for recovery. But for me, it is a lifelong process and a lifelong journey to be fit for health, for my, for my longevity. longevity. Um, and so it's been an ongoing process for me. Where I am now is nowhere where I was when I was your age. When I was your age, yes, I was eating McDonald's. I had candy. I, you know, I was eating hardly any vegetables. Um, what I ate at that age bracket, you know, in middle school, high school, you know, teenage years, looks nothing like what I eat now. Completely 180 from what, what I eat now. And I think my students, when they see what I eat now, would have a very hard time believing that I ate any of that food. Um, but that's, that's where I started, and I realized very quickly when I got into college, um, as I gained 15 pounds my freshman fall semester, uh, that I needed to make some changes. And that's where my evolution started, is that I can't continue to eat this type of food um, because it's not helping me as an athlete, and I'm not healthy. So, you know, I started to pay a little bit more attention, started to make some shifts, started to do more research and stay aware. Um, and I was also fortunate that my family, my mom, my dad, my sister, were kind of on a similar journey at a similar timetable, um, that we were all kind of getting different nuggets and we would share, you know, have you gone to Whole Foods? Because Whole Foods was just kind of developing at that point. Now, Whole Foods, I think, is on a different path now with Amazon and that sort of stuff. So, um, but back in the, you know, it would have been probably in the mid to late 90s is when Whole Foods and some of this organic lifestyles and choices of eating were starting to become more important and more uh, available, I would say. It wasn't that it wasn't there before, but it was becoming a little bit more available to the mainstream. And that's when I started to kind of tap into what does it mean to be organic, why is that important, and um, getting a lot more vegetables. And what I would consider eating nutrient-dense foods is a really big key in getting away from processed foods. I grew up with plenty of processed foods. Um, that was kind of what was happening when, during when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s is a lot of processed food. Um, and so I did come up through that, and now I realize how bad that is. And that's where our culture as Americans has shifted, and there is a lot of health problems in our society because of processed foods and sugars. Um, and so that's what we're seeing as a society in general. And these are the messages that I try and get across to my students as to why that's not good for us overall and why it's not good for us, especially as athletes that are, you know, finely tuned, hopefully high performing athletes we need especially to be you know paying attention to these things if we really want to max out our performance so sometimes you can, you hear of goalkeepers that play goalkeeper because they don't feel fit enough to play on the field and some goalkeepers even skip out and strengthen agility agility training because they don't think they need it how important is physical fitness and agility it is more important for us as goalkeepers to be honest or equal at least equally important if for any athlete, if they want to maximize their potential, those are areas that they're going to hit. So whether you're a field player, a goalkeeper, you know, basketball player, you pick it, the sport, you know, any sport that involves agility and explosive um, components, like say, like I'm saying, basketball, soccer, you know, football, you name it, pick a sport that has an explosive movement. These are things that are important to be fit, to be explosive, to get into the weight room, to work on your agility. Um, so any athlete that wants to reach their max potential is going to invest the time in those areas so um, I would not say it's position, position specific by any means um, to, to reach my potential as a goalkeeper that was one of the biggest lessons I learned when I got to UNC. So I've been told by some coaches that I'm too small for the position and there's a lot of stereotypical <laughs> tall or, small, or shorter. How important do you think size is? Certainly um, the height and the stature of the goalkeeper may make certain saves easier certainly if I was six feet tall you know making saves at the crossbar would become easier it also though makes it a little bit more challenging oftentimes for the taller goalkeeper to get down quickly whether it be breakaways or on low shots so there's pluses and minuses to every kind of aspect and for you know the smaller statured goalkeepers if you are going to survive because obviously it is a tall goal that you're going to have to cover more space if you're a smaller goalkeeper well then you're going to have to maximize other aspects of your position to survive so for my 
goalkeepers that are smaller in size, they need to be exceptional with their technique. So they they don't have the luxury of dropping balls. They don't have the luxury um, of not being as good technically with their diving, their breakaways, their crosses, their footwork. Their footwork is going to have to be impeccable because they can't get away with poor timing because they're six feet tall or you know five feet ten. Um, compared to the you know five foot two goalkeeper that has to be absolutely precise with her timing in order to win that ball at the crossbar and be absolutely precise with her positioning and that's going to be a big aspect for the smaller goalkeeper is they can't they don't have the luxury of making a poor decision with their positioning because if they're one step off in their positioning they will get exposed whereas the five foot ten goalkeeper can get away with it okay and in addition my smaller goalkeepers are going to have to maximize their physical potential even more so their vertical jump becomes uh, of all their physical components is going to become the most important physical component for them to work on I mean certainly they are all going to help and you're going to benefit from working on all of them but that vertical jump and that explosive power will be even more important to the smaller goalkeeper whereas the taller goalkeeper their agility may become more important their flexibility may become more important so they can get away with some things because of their height but then they need to focus on maybe their footwork so they're going to have different focuses um and you know what a coach chooses to prioritize yes do oftentimes do many coaches look at the taller goalkeepers and give them the benefit of the doubt because of their height yeah oftentimes they do is it right in my book no I, I personally think that you need to evaluate each goalkeeper based on their skill set and get, give them a fair look and then evaluate all aspects of the them as a goalkeeper. Um, but that's not always what happens. So end of the day, you've got to just control what you can control as an athlete. And there are going to be some coaches that are going to look beyond you as a smaller goalkeeper and you can't control that. It's a tough lesson and it's harsh, um, but it is what it is. And so for us... What we need to look at is what can I control? I can control my physical preparation. I can get technically super, super sharp. And tactically, I can be very precise in my positioning and really good at reading the game so that I can win breakaways outright, so I can make the correct decision on crosses, so that I can still dominate on crosses. I might have to box more than I can catch. As certainly as I get higher up in levels, it's going to get harder for me to catch against taller, more competitive, better forwards so I may get forced to box more often so how you um, address the game as a smaller goalkeeper may be different but there's still a place for you and there will be coaches that will value you and will understand what you bring to the game because I have several examples of students of mine and one of them is a staff coach that was here with me um, this weekend presenting or yesterday so it wasn't this weekend this this past what day we were on Friday so yesterday Thursday when I was presenting my session I had one of my former students Megan Kinneman who's now coach uh, assistant coach at Rice University she had a four-year career at LSU and she's five foot four and she competed against a six foot goalkeeper in her collegiate career and battled out and competed and, and one time you know back and forth with this other goalkeeper um, and then continued on and played as a reserve at the Houston Dash and played for professionally in Norway so she though I will say was impeccable on breakaways she spent countless hours getting better at back to the bar tipping over the bar and dealing with shots at the crossbar and she knew she had to be absolutely precise with her positioning to be able to make those saves um, so she invested a lot of time to hone her craft and never um, gave up on herself based on what coaches told her and what coaches didn't look at her she knew you know she didn't make any excuses what are some of the things you look for in someone with, as a potential goalkeeper? I would first look at their work ethic um, and their, you know, their drive and their determination because that's going to determine a lot of pieces. Um, I would look at their overall athleticism, you know, their raw athleticism because those are pieces um, that are harder to coach. They can be, all of that can be improved as a coach. So. No matter what athleticism my student comes into me with, I think that can be improved. But certainly there is a spectrum of students that some are more athletic than others. Um, same with the mentality. Some come in with a more competitive drive, more competitive edge than others. Um, and again, every athlete I think can be moved along that spectrum further along. So for me, I'm looking at their work ethic, their competitive fire, their discipline. Um, 
their self-esteem, their confidence. A lot of them are mental factors because the technical and the tactical, I think, can be brought along. Um, and the athletic pieces, again, the more athletic the goalkeeper, you know, the more we can bring them along. I feel like many good goalkeepers come from the East Coast, West Coast, and Midwest. It can be tough to find good goalkeepers. If someone is in an area without goalkeeper talent or coaching, what can they do? Well, this day and age, I would say because of between social media and just the internet in general, you've got a lot more access to content than we ever had. Never had any of that. We didn't even see the game on TV. So I was waiting for, you know, Soccer America to come out in print and come to me in the mail. And then it was like a month late. I was getting the news like a month after it had happened. So it was really hard to see the women's game. Definitely never saw the women's game. But it was really hard to get footage on any type of soccer. So I think if you're looking for inspiration and if you're looking for drills, you can find that footage. Um, that's a lot more available these days, so you can get some of that footage. So that's number one. I would say get online if you're into some of these areas and, and see what you can find as far as drills that you can get either your local coach to help you with, your mom and dad to help you with, a teammate to help you with, and a lot of the stuff is stuff that you can do with a rebound or off a wall. I spent a lot of time throwing balls off my roof. Um, when I was growing up, to be honest, I went to one camp a summer. I didn't have a goalkeeper coach until I got to college, um, and I, you know, grew up in Massachusetts I grew up in a decent area but you know there weren't goalkeeper coaches that were around in my era we didn't have that club soccer was just developing so you know we didn't have a plethora of coaches so I went to soccer plus camp every summer picked up what I could took notes and then when I went home the rest of the year it was practicing jumping over hurdles in my you know front yard I was juggling on my own in my front yard like I said I would be throwing balls off the roof and then tracking it and trying to find out where it was going to pop off off the gutter and catch a high ball. This is how I trained high balls and crosses on my own. I would go to the high school and I would strike balls off the brick wall. You know, this is, you know, how I got myself better. And I was fortunate to have a high school coach. Um, grew up in North Andover. My high school coach, um, Kevin McCarthy, was great about coming to me and saying, how can I help you? So I give him a lot of credit as a coach that he understood his strengths and weaknesses and he understood that I had more information about the position based on the camps that I had attended that he could help me best by creating environments by asking me what can I do to help you I'm happy to help you you just tell me what I need to do so I was lucky that I had that in my high school coach to improve so these are the, you know suggestions that I would have for players that may not have a goalkeeper coach at their availability and they may not have a really good club structure you know within their area that they can still improve um, and get to the levels that they want to get to. And not to use that as a, a crutch or an excuse. You talk about the importance of tactical IQ in coaching. How can this be developed? Well, there, you know, one of the major ways is by watching the game more, but it's not just simply watching, it's how you watch it. So I can watch the game for enjoyment, like, oh, I really want my team to win, they just scored a goal, like there's that, you know, superficial way of kind of enjoying the game, or I can watch the game critically. So if I'm going to watch a game critically as a goalkeeper, one, if I can watch the game from in behind the goalkeeper, that's going to give me the perspective that I'm going to be seeing in a game. The perspective from the sidelines is very different than what you see as a goalkeeper during the game. So. For goalkeepers, if you have the opportunity to sit behind a goal and watch a high-level game, it could be if you're in high school, watching a collegiate game. Men's, women's, either is going to be beneficial if it's a higher level than what you're used to seeing. I think sometimes when we go and we watch as a youth player and we go and watch the pro game, sometimes the jump is so vast that it's hard to kind of understand all of what's going on because it happens so fast. Um, so if you're you know, a 10-year-old, it might be going to the local high school game or a local top club game. You know, and then exposing yourself to some college games and then exposing yourself to some pro games. I think seeing all the different levels is going to be beneficial, but also not seeing a level that's too fast, too early, that you can't appreciate all of the details that is going on. Um, but then when you are watching the game, to watch it critically, meaning you can start to ask yourself questions. What is the system of play that the team is playing that I'm watching? Just observe one team, the goalkeeper that's in front of you. What is their system of play? Where are they getting exposed? And what is the goalkeeper doing and communicating to help organize his or her defense? So now you're actually having to think while you're watching the game. So you have to kind of approach the game from a different mindset in order to learn and improve your tactical IQ. Um, and sometimes this is going to, as a young player, this may require a coach 
sitting next to you at the game to kind of help you as to to understand and appreciate what you're seeing. You know, and then looking at observing the goalkeeper and what is their style of play, what is his or her decision making look like? Did they make good decisions? You know, if a goal happens, why did it happen? You know, and how much of it was their responsibility or was it a team responsibility? It's usually somewhere in between the two. What questions do you want players to ask when they watch maybe their own game, a game on TV, or a game in person? You know, I would look at, you know, initially, superficially, you know, like kind of the, the bigger questions would be, you know, what are the goalkeeper's strengths and what are the goalkeeper's areas that they need to continue to work on? So I would kind of look at, if I'm looking at it from a goalkeeper's perspective, I, I might want to appreciate what's that, what are that goalkeeper's strengths, what are their weaknesses, um, and if I was their coach, what areas then would I spend on investing in the next training session to help them become a better goalkeeper? Um, so those would be some of the questions I would look at. I would ask them, you know, to observe the system of play and where is their team getting exposed. So if they're consistently dealing with through balls and that goalkeeper's having to make a lot of breakaway saves in the game because they're getting their defense is getting beat either over the top or split through their back line, what is the goalkeeper needing to adjust and how can that goalkeeper make an impact through communication to help his or her team? So those would be kind of some of the ways that I would approach them watching the game. So one of my challenges is really using my voice. I know the game and I can see the problems or exposure and I don't always feel comfortable talking and commanding. Is there any tips that you would have? First I would embrace that is your, that it is your role as a goalkeeper to be the leader in the back and to not worry about what people think about what you say and not worry about if you say the right thing or the wrong thing. So you've got to go through a process of getting comfortable with speaking loud and projecting your voice so that's the first one is that we've got to get comfortable with using our outdoor voice and commanding because this is my job this is my role I can be a totally different personality when I'm off the field but when I come onto the field and I put those gloves on this is part of my part of my job if I want to be effective and make my life easier then this is something I have to embrace really early Um, in addition how you communicate is super important the tone and the volume Um, not only is it the information but the tone and the volume is super important so if you want your teammates to be on board with you and understand that you are there to help them being positive encouraging and just in in a, a good direct tone not a yelling tone not a derogatory tone not a frustrated tone not an annoyed tone there's all kinds of different tones out there so if you can be direct think about it as that you are commanding your dog your dog is outside and you want your dog to come in you're gonna you know come Fido come come you know or sit down it's direct it's short it's specific it's not derogatory it's not mean so I think if you kind of look at it from that perspective you'll be one more effective as a communicator maybe you'll be less concerned about how your teammates are going to um, view you I think we have to kind of release that fear that my teammates aren't going to like me if I'm yelling at them because first of all you're not yelling at them you're organizing them and you're helping them and once they understand that they're actually what they're going to do is go what my teammates would say Tracy keep talking to us we love the help we love the information because if you're good at being an effective communicator you're a second set of eyes for them and you're helping them because their focus is on the ball and they may not be seeing what's happening behind them so when you're getting good at that your defensive unit wants to hear from you and that takes time to establish that rapport and that trust, but we have to start somewhere. Many girls like me might try and avoid conflict. How can we value these traits without losing competitiveness? Why do you, so you said you avoid conflict? Yeah. My question back to you is would be, why do you feel like you avoid conflict? What is the fear? that prompts that you avoid conflict with your teammates just with anyone with anyone yeah other coaching staffs people in general yeah okay so I would explore that portion first is what is the fear behind avoiding conflict because that's what's driving it so do you know do you have an answer back to me on that one I don't think I do so I would explore that one for yourself is yeah it's it's hard there's a fear there that you're you're afraid of either judgment 
you're afraid that you might do, say or do the wrong thing. There's pieces there that I think for you to explore as an individual as to why am I afraid of conflict. Um, and if you start to kind of dissolve that, you may get more comfortable with engaging in a com- in conversation and some communication it is hard to approach your coach it can be hard to approach a teammate that maybe you aren't getting along with it is difficult but the, as you start to practice it and approach them what you'll realize is they're probably just as scared of that situation as you are and it's intimidating but as you start to approach them as a human being and that you want to get think, make things better for them and for you and that you're teammates it will improve. I think what you'll, you will find if you start to venture down that path is that they will appreciate it just as much as you will appreciate it. Nobody likes conflict, um, and it's not healthy for team chemistry. So you have to kind of, um, I would say, embrace these difficult environments as an opportunity for growth and choosing courage over comfort. This is a huge lesson that comes out of Brene Brown. I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown's uh, lessons. So, yeah, it's uncomfortable, right? It's really uncomfortable to deal with uh, conflict. But if I can have the courage to address it, it's going to improve. It's not going to improve if I avoid it. It's only going to fester and get worse. And it's either going to cause me stress, and that's not helpful, and I won't perform well as a player. So if you kind of look at it from that perspective, I think it will give you the courage to address it versus sitting in comfort and hoping that it will just go away. Because it, it won't go away magically on its own. After I have a really tough game, I try and reset. More than once, I've watched the 99 games to clear my mind and be inspired. As a player during this period, how does it feel to know that your hard work is still appreciated? Um, I'm actually, it's really nice to hear, to be honest, because I think most uh, students that I deal with that are your age don't even know who we are. <laughs> so it's a, a pleasant surprise uh, when I get students that come in that are your age to my camp uh, these days that they have no idea. Uh, who I am oftentimes or that I was on the 99 World Cup and that we won in 99 so it's um, a pleasant surprise to hear that from your from your mouth and um, happy happy to hear that we are still making impact on today's generation because most of the students that are your age are relating to you know the current World Cup team which is natural and expected and they are great role models um, from you know the 2019 team and you know the team before that in 20. Uh, 15. The, you know, the last two World Cup winning teams, um, I think, are exceptional role models as well. So, um, thank you. So, I had read a story about Tony DiCicco and the goalkeepers having their own fitness training and the field players not liking it. Could you tell the story and how it helped the team? In college, our fitness standards were slightly adjusted um, at UNC. They were close, um, and I always made sure that I made, after my freshman year, I made sure that. I passed field player standards because that was my standard. But on the national team, our standards were the same. I mean, we had sometimes separate training sessions, but that just meant we were out there longer um, because we would go do goalkeeping before the actual team environment. So we would be out there for like three hours um, because that was when he could train us in goalkeeper-specific stuff because as the head coach, you know, he couldn't just separate himself away to train the goalkeepers. So the goalkeepers, we would go out early, and then we would be integrated into the teams. I think there were some times that they would, you know, feel like the goalkeepers weren't working as hard and they didn't have an appreciation of what, how much the up and down and, like, all of that is a different type of fitness. And so, yeah, so he would occasionally have these, like, all right, let's be a goalkeeper today and put them through some of what we did. And I think that's how some of these field players ended up in goal and then they got a much better appreciation of what life is like as a goalkeeper diving around and getting up and getting down and getting up and getting down. So yeah, our demands physically are much different. We don't have to run 120 yards, but we have these other demands that are equally as hard, just different. So yeah, that that may be of kind of what you're touching on. So how did Tony's Tony, Tony's style of coaching and other great coaches like Anton Dorrance impact your life and your coaching today? Uh, yeah, countless ways. Um, I, I would say um, Anson um, was a really great motivator, um, and I really always appreciated how honest he was. Um, certainly it, early in my career, I, it was hard to hear, but 
as I embraced the information that he was giving me and understood that it was honest, good feedback, it allowed me to develop and grow as a player. Um, it, he held me accountable, um, and then I, it was up to me as to what I was going to do with that information. Um, and um, every player that sits in his room and gets that information, you have a choice. You know, are you going to take that information and apply it and, and be accountable and responsible and make changes, or, you know, are you going to not apply yourself? So for me, it was really good feedback to have. Um, that helped me grow as a player. So I would say that the direct, honest feedback and how good he is at motivating his players and understanding um, the team culture and motivating us as individuals and incorporating that into the team culture and motivating the team as a, as a unit is um, exceptional on top of obviously how great he is tactically in developing us you know, as players in our system of play and bringing the whole team together as a unit. Um, but that, you know, individually, I would say those are the two things that I gained a lot from him. And then coaching-wise, it was understanding the, the system and the tactics. I definitely learned a lot from him as a player on the tactical side of the game and understanding the defense. Because every pregame, we were going over pressure cover balance. We were going over our system of play. So that's where I think I grew a lot tactically as a player which then helped me as I transitioned into a coach um, and then Tony um, I was fortunate to have Tony as a coach growing up at Soccer Plus so he was a mentor for me really early on before I ever you know was underneath him as, as my coach on the national team um, so I definitely would say Soccer Plus is a really big foundation for my development as a coach and the methodologies that I use that would have been my foundations is because I came through Soccer Plus as a kid every summer and then I worked for him for several years. I can't, I'd have to go back to my resume to know how many years that I worked at Soccer Plus, but countless weeks every summer uh, throughout college and beyond when I was playing on the national team, I became a director for him. So I definitely owe a lot of my foundations as a coach for goalkeeping to Tony. And then my you know grander tactical stuff would be a lot from Anson. And um, just Tony's overall passion for the game and um, I would say that, you know, my overall passion for the game um, was observed a lot through Tony. He really enjoyed what he did. And I clearly remember him showing up to training countless times saying, I love my job, just like shouting it out, which is such joy. The joy that he had for his job was palpable by all of us. Um, as players and it really made the environment fun and so that example that he set as a coach is really alive in my head and that's an environment that I would love to recreate even in some small form or fashion for my players if I can get one ounce of that to my players then you know I'm, I'm doing a good job so I had a friend tell me that there's a funny story about you in a Holly Halloween costume something about coconuts <laughs> <laughs> That's really, you got some good good insight from somebody on that one. That's probably the only Halloween costume I think I've ever had. Um, I've never been good at being creative with Halloween costumes. It was always like a last second deal. And so myself and my teammate Don Crow um, in college, we were doing some kind of get together with the team. And so we decided to do um, a rendition of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And if you've ever watched Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the horses, when they're coming along, had a set of coconuts, and they were clip-clapping the coconuts together to, to uh, recreate the hoofs of the horses. And so I think we used some sheets, made ourselves like the Knights of the Holy Grail, and then our coconuts, and then we got some cheap little plastic swords. So that was probably the only Halloween costume I think I'd ever had since maybe when I was in, you know, elementary school. Now, do you have any other good stories I should ask Don Curl about in the future? <laughs> Was that your source? Yep. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, nothing's coming, but I will get back to you for sure. Okay. So it looks like we've made it to our last question. Oh. So the last question is, what do you hope people remember about your impact to soccer and the world? For me, I hope they remember how much I cared about them as a person. That, to me, would be the most fulfilling. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Yep. My pleasure. So I encourage you to reach out to any female keepers that you know that may be interested in a small, close environment like Dynasty Goalkeeping. It would be a really great experience. And until I see you next week, remember to keep the game beautiful. Mm -hmm.